I am this endangered species, a mythologist. I don't think it's safe to be a mythologist if you're not also a storyteller, because a mythologist looks at all the different layers of a story, the cultural layers, the mystical layers, the um, personal layers, but you really want to have that story working in your jaw, not just in your pen. Uh, often I say to my students, if you hear a story from me, don't think it your duty not to tell it, uh, because something happens when you start to move the story around in the meat hall of your jaw. So for a long time now, it is, I'm going to be 50 on Sat Sunday, on Sunday, so I'm in, the, I'm in the dying moments of my 40s, and I've elected to spend it with you. Um, and for half that period, half my life, I have done this strange occupation, mythology, storytelling, and it all stems actually from something called Wilderness Rites of Passage, which I was first exposed to coincidentally and providentially from the story we've just been told, Snowdonia. Uh, I spent a period of time up there, four days and nights fasting, and when I came back, I had been fundamentally and properly rewired. But I found that the language I spoke after it didn't do justice to the encounter. I think most of us these days speak an uninitiated language. The old phrase they used to use, and John Matthews is very good at reminding us of this, the old phrase that the Bardics, the Bardic teachers used to use when they composed verse was dark speech, initiated speech, Gnostic speech. And I didn't have any of that. At that age of 23 or so, uh, my mouth was a place where words went to die. And so I elected to go back to the stories of my childhood, the myths, the legends, the folk tales, and see how they felt at a different stage of my life. How do we talk about profound encounters with what David Abram calls the more than human world. And so my work effectively began. And funnily enough, like the story we've just heard, I lived in a tent. I did live in a yurt for four years. And luckily enough, this was just before really the advent of laptops and phones, or well, certainly for me. So you were still able to, other than a few pals, fundamentally disappear. And so at the very end of the last century, I disappeared. So the book I'm going to talk about this evening, Smoke Hole, is a weave, really, between my long-term predilection for fairy tales and my long-term involvement with wilderness rites of passage. All the way through the book, there's a thread between both disciplines. They talk to each other all the way through. Before Smoke Hole, there was another book. Uh, I've been a very happy writer for a publisher called Chelsea Green for the last few years. They asked me to write a book called Courting the Wild Twin. I did. The moment that the book made its way into the public, lockdown occurred. And so, sadly, the real stand and deliver encounter of oral storytelling uh, was something that was taken from me. We, there, were, there were no public events. But against all sort of, uh, all logic, which you should never trust entirely anyway, against all logic, the book started to sell. And suddenly there were letters from Australia and letters from the Arctic and letters from India, letters from Africa, South America, a lot from America, a lot from Europe, some from England and Ireland and Scotland and Wales. And there was an energy for the book, possibly because it's quite short. Uh, short books can be a good thing uh, in times of peril. But you, but I, like everyone else, was plunged into lockdown. And the thing that I petitioned as we went into this encounter, this sort of group encounter that in my life I'd never seen anything like, I wrote a letter that was printed in a magazine called Emergence, and I suggested, could we approach this in a way that the, the Desert Fathers would have approached it? Could this be a move not towards isolation, but towards solitude? 
was this in fact a unique moment in our life where we could put down an awful lot of distractions and deeply listen. I also felt at the beginning of the encounter with COVID, I had nothing to say about it. I didn't want to offer any premature um, reassurances. I didn't want to provide handrails because something I learned through my work with Wilderness Rites of Passage is that when you're in the thing, when you're at the bottom of the well, when you're in the initiatory encounter, that's not the time to be sifting it up into the intelligence of the brain. You've got to be down there in the, in the meat of the thing, in the chthonic of the thing. So I didn't have anything of any particular wisdom to say for a while. In the middle of lockdown, I did have a brief we all had in England a brief reprieve of, it was only weeks really, where we got out and about. And I led, or actually no, I didn't lead, I was part of a group that was putting together a wilderness vigil, a wilderness in a forest very near to me. So suddenly after months alone, I was with a group of folks round a fire. And it was actually as I was sitting with them and I watched the smoke moving up between them, I suddenly had the idea for the book Smoke Hole. Finally, I had something I wanted to think about, something that I wanted to write about. And I went away, grabbed, uh, you know, a journal and a pen. And within about five days, the gist of the book was written. Five days. Now that's that's unusual. Um, most books take a long time. My my first few books usually took about five years each, but these didn't operate like that. I got written, in a sense, and most writers will know when you get a lucky break like that. The book almost wrote itself in front of me, and the first thing that I wanted to write about was something that I was hearing in the public, the public arena a lot at the time. And it was this sentiment, touch nothing, touch nothing. Do you remember, you know, don't touch doors, don't touch curtains, don't touch people, go into hiding. Well, it made me, or it reminded me of an old fairy tale that I loved called The Handless Maiden. And in that story, and some of you probably know it, it, I don't want to ruin the surprise, but a woman loses her hands, a young woman, through a great travesty of her father. And she goes about the slow, redemptive, difficult business of growing them back. It's an incredible story. And so the first thing that I thought when I recognized that we culturally or as cultures are in some kind of rather nebulously held initiatory experience, we were like her. And the question then for me was at some unspecified point in the future, how do we begin the process of growing our own hands back? So that was the first third of the book. Books for me often are triadic. They seem three is a, is a sort of a magical number. If you've got one and two, it's very dual. But if you have three, something unexpected happens. It's like the tip of an arrow. So the second thing that I wanted to reflect on after this long period of lockdown is the second part of the book, which deals with a different story. And the title of the second part is Breaking Enchantments. Breaking Enchantments because I realized that although I still stand by the notion that um, it's a good thing to seek solitude, it's a good thing to have uh, periods of profound quiet and contemplation, it's something of a discipline. And if you don't have much of experience of it, it can drive you a little crazy. And the breaking enchantments that I was referring to within the store, within the book, within the story, are not necessarily enchantments out there in the world. They're the narratives, the unhelpful, grinding, uh, personal narratives that uh, 
befuddle us. And one of the problems of being alone for a long time is you have no one to wake you out of those subtle little trance states. So I went to a story that is not very well known. Uh, it's called The Bewitched Princess. And it's about a young woman. She's a, she has, as you know, the, the clues in the name. She is, a, she is a princess and her lover is someone called the hostile mountain spirit, who is this great being that lives behind her high up in a mountain. God knows how their relationship kicked into gear. But the way she keeps him alive is by bringing him the blood of young men. And what she does is there's a message all over the land that if you want to marry the bewitched, the young princess, no one calls her the bewitched princess, you have to answer three very strange riddles that she gives you that actually are whispered to her by the hostile mountain spirit. Now, these are riddles that you could not possibly fathom. So it's a sort of death sentence to engage. Uh, but in a starving culture, people will go for it. And the story really is about breaking that particular enchantment. And as a young man called Peter, with the help of an ancestral spirit, gets to actually get up close and personal to the hostile mountain spirit and hear quite what is going on. So after the notion of growing our hands back, the second part of the book, Breaking Enchantments, is just paying attention to the, the enchantments that we set on ourselves as well as anybody else. It's funny, actually, as a, as a storyteller, over the years, every now and then, if someone has come to see me live, people tend to say, thank you, what, a, what an enchantment that was, what an enchanter you are. And actually, it's a personal turn of phrase but i i don't respond to it great storytelling for me breaks enchantments great storytelling cuts through illusions and helps you see the ground of your being in a deeper way i think most of us despite the hubris of the west despite the seeming self-esteem of the west i think actually most of us don't feel great about ourselves a lot of the time and actually, and I've said this for years, we are heavily defended against an experience of our own beauty. I'll say it again, heavily defended and against an experience of our own beauty. And the, that second bit, breaking enchantments, kind of wrestles like Jacob wrestling with the angel. It, re it wrestles with that, that part of the predicament and, and the kind of nuttiness that happens when you've been walking the road alone for a long time. Now the third and final part of the book, and I'll read from the book in a sec, is called Kicking the Robbers Out of the House. That's my favorite title of the whole thing, Kicking the Robbers Out of the House. Because another thing that was happening during lockdown, of course, is that our time on social media, our time virtually, for a lot of us got you know hysterical uh, it got uh, it got far beyond anything that we could regard as healthy and i realized that my opinions my uh, my likes my dislikes were sort of continually infused if if i was if i was passive if i let myself just sort of drift through social media or netflix with many different um, many different uh, persuasions that didn't necessarily really have my best interests at heart. And so the final part of the book really is actually really talking about the, the difficult part of technology. Technology is so extraordinary. Modern medicine is so incredible. The light of it is clear. But we remember, of course, what Jung said, whatever casts the greatest light has an enormous shadow shuffling right next to it. And um, that's really about the shadow of technology 
don't mistake that for me saying it's all bad. I'm just saying we have to go into it and approach it consciously. The question that I ask is when did a tool become a deity? Because be for sure, if you're spending an enormous amount of time focused on a foot or half a foot in front of you like I am now, you become less aware of the things at the very edges of your imagination, uh, the very edge of your vision, in fact. And you will know this, all the old stories say when a culture is in crisis, it's not what right, is right in front of us that's going to help. Why do you think the knights from Camelot are always galloping out to places like Snowdonia, out to the margins? Um, so that was the final part of the book, really. And that final story, incredible. You know, for years, people say to me, do you have a story for now, Dr. Shaw? And it always makes me irritable, as if I can kind of produce something perfectly garlanded for now. But actually, I did find a story, a story, more importantly, found me from the Caucasus. It's a story called The Spyglass. And it is about, it's about a king who gives his daughter this spyglass. And when she puts it up to her eye, she can see anything that is going on in the world, anything at all. And, and this has a slight relationship to the previous story. If you want to court her, you have to prove that you can disappear three, when she looks for you three times through the spyglass. But of course, she always finds you and it always ends badly. And a young hunter takes up the challenge. And along the way, the hunter has become friends with a goat. He's become friends with an eagle. He's become friends with a fish. He's become friends with a fox. And the first time she goes to look for him, he hides with the eagle. She finds him. Second time, he hides with the goat. She finds him. Third time, he hides, actually he hides in, in a fish like Jonah, he crawls in. But the last time, the last time when the pressure is really high because he's petitioned for another day of this experience, the fox digs a hole in the ground and, and he follows right underneath the feet of the young woman. And the fox says, the one place the spyglass can't find you is right underneath the feet of the daughter. And of course, spells get broken and wonderful things happen. But really, it culminated in a question for me is, what do we have right underneath our feet? What is the stuff that is not just transactional, but transformational? What is the stuff that um, is the strange little crooked narrative of our own life? before we were, you know, gobbling ayahuasca or reading esoteric books or anything like that, the simple conditions that you were born into, your family, the, uh, the particular narrative, encounters, betrayals you've gone through, what's that all about? Dare you take it seriously? So that is a, that's a taste of smoke hole, but let me read you something from the beginning. Where are we? In Siberian myth, when you want to hurt someone, you crawl into their tent and close the smoke hole. That way God can't see them. Close the smoke hole and you break connection to the divine world, mountains, rivers, trees. If you close the smoke hole, you become mad. This is what I was telling people at the beginning of lockdown. Close the smoke hole and we are possessed by ourselves and only ourselves. Close the smoke hole and you have only your neurosis for company. Not enough of that. Let's take a breath. We're grown-ups. We may have to seek some solitude, but let's not isolate from the marvellous. High alert is the nature of the moment, and rightly so, but I do not intend to lose the reality that as a culture we are entering deeply mythic ground. I am forgetting business as usual, no great story begins like that. And so these were the questions that I took into lockdown. What needs to change? What needs to deepen? What kindness in me have I so abandoned that I could seek relationship with again? 
it is useful to inspect my ruin. Could I strike up an old relationship with my soul again? Before we burn the whole world down in the wider range of climate emergency, of which this current climate, uh, current crisis is just a hint, could we collectively seek vigil in this moment? Cry for a vision. It's what we've always done and we need to do it now. And I think we needed to do it 18 months ago and I think we, we still need to do it. So that sort of kicks the book off. And I'll read one last bit and then I'll turn it over to some questions. You remember I talked about what is underneath our feet, the ground that is unique to us. And I describe it here as the place, which is us really, between smoke hole and prayer mat. So let's start by kneeling down because the thing I'd love to talk about is beneath us, the ground the spyglass can't quite access, remember that? It's a little worn, possibly with hurt feelings, but it's there. It's a prayer mat. We're all praying to something. I know there's a lot to hold our attention right now, and everywhere I glance, there's a screen pummeling us with statistics, but I'm going to ask us to lower our gaze for a moment, you and I. Examine the weave of your mat. Scrunch up your nose and rub up to the dizzy, strange scent of its perfume. There's no one size fits all mat. There are countless millions of prayer mats and every last one is different. They're just enough room for you to kneel on and that's about it. It may not look like much with all these other distractions, but we make things holy by the kind of attention we give them. I think that's probably the most important line in the book actually. We make things holy by the kind of attention we give them. So let's look at the weave, because it's moving. There's a Norwegian tugboat pulling into Alexandria at midnight. There are pale stars over a Provencal castle. There's a desert woman weaving an emu feather into her hair. If we keep paying attention to this little stretch of rug, strange things happen. We start to witness a secret history of the earth, which is what myth is. It's the secret history of the earth. Not the only history, but one tributary of a bigger river that eventually leads to the vast ocean of time and consequence. And we behold this with our old mind, not our new mind. Sometimes I call this bone memory, not skin or flesh, but bone knowing. <coughs> it's what makes storytellers. Keep looking at the mat because beyond even your people, there are swooping cranes and misty Welsh hills, lush Ecuadorian valleys and miles and miles of flowers. These are your ancestors too. I say it again, we make things holy by the kind of attention we give them. In a time when we are begging for a new story, it may be the stories we need are supporting us right now, if only we would lower our gaze. Many of us don't know it, or more likely have been seduced into forgetting. When you forget what you kneel upon, you are far more easily influenced by energies that may not wish you well. Well, enough of that. It's time to kick the robbers out of the house. I want my imagination back. All right, so that's a bit of, uh, a bit of smoke hole. Yes, for the last 18 years, uh, I've been running something called the West Country School of Myth, where, believe it or not, you can come down to Dartmoor and study with me. Uh, we do these five weekend programs. We do vigils out in the forest. I actually run an MA as well, Poetics of Imagination at uh, Dartington Art School. So you can come in from a variety of angles. I'm busy. weirdly just before lockdown began unknowing of course i said i found if i did sense something was in the wind but i never could have named it as covid 
I had gone out into a, a Dartmoor forest every day for 101 days. And the reason I did it was this. There's lo local folklore around here says that if you get bitten by a werewolf, uh, it takes 101 days for the infection to pass from your body. And during that point, you wear nothing but white and you stay in and you avoid women and you have unpolluted thoughts and all of that kind of thing. And I felt that I needed more fur, not less. So I reversed the ceremony. Uh, and I thought, no, I'll go out into the woods. And for 101 days, I won't, I'm not on the take. That's the problem is we often go out into wild settings as a therapeutic backdrop for whatever particular process we want to indulge in at the time. We're not really listening. So I wanted to listen. I wanted more fur in my mind and my thinking. And so for 101 days, I did that. Uh, the last night of it was, it was, I did an all night vigil. It was phenomenally cold. I, I can't even describe how cold it was. Um, and the book, you know, or the description of the, that came out, it, the whole thing shattered my life. It changed my life entirely. Don't get involved in these things if you're not expecting profound transformation. But as I staggered back from it, it was only later that day that I realized that as a country, we were now going into lockdown. So I went into the process of lockdown already having been spiritually tenderized out into the forest for 101 days. And the full story of that experience uh, will come out next year, actually. It's a book I've written called Bard Skull. Uh, and uh, it's with Unbound Books, which means we need to fund it. So uh, if you wanted to do anything uh, uh, to help, I'd really appreciate it. Unbound.com, just look for Bard Skull. But it's the big book of that whole long um, devotional process and where it took me. So this is the weird thing. Uh, I go through, I go through this long, long, long process in the forest. I go out on the last night and I, I can say this candidly because I'm not trying to prove anything. By that point, I just wanted it to be over. You know, the feeling it's the last hour before that. I just wanted it to be over. Uh, and actually what you find is <laughs> it wasn't over and extraordinary things happened that night. But when I got back, I, I suddenly, and it was right across my vision and it was as if the words were in gold. I was given nine words as reward or not even reward let's call it response to the vigil and i'll tell you what they were it's rather odd this is what i got inhabit the time and genesis of your original home inhabit the time and genesis of your original home uh and there's a kind of a bump in that sentence there's something that's rather hard to hold on to it's like a salmon in your hand so i've had a lot of time to think about it and there is a lot that i'll have to say about it at some point in the future but i'm fermenting and it's never wise to, to disclose too much while you're fermenting but the time and genesis of my original home in terms of my family and our lineage there's a word for that, and it's not a word I'd thought about for a very, very long time. Uh, and the word is Eden. That's the beginning of things in the tradition that my family have. And not Eden as a place that is a part of a wonderful Jewish mythopoetic story, not a place of uh, snakes and men made of mud and women who are really ribs, and shame and sexual shame or that for me is an extraordinary description of a process that went on in men and women's hearts for thousands of years in relationship to what in christian circles is called you know your maker 
But the Celtic Christians, who are so wonderful and interesting and kind of ribald and pagan in a way, they say, no, Eden, Eden is a place. It's a place in the interior. Do you remember, you know, the kingdom of God is within you. E Eden is a place you can locate uh, as you get older. It's a place you can return to. Now, if you know the biblical story, there's actually an angel with a, fl a flaming sword stopping you from coming back in again. Because as a mythologist, the notion of the fall, which is kind of essential in any story, to my way of thinking about it, is the underworld. And every story worth its salt has an underworld in it. Um, but I sometimes wonder as a culture, we've got so familiar with the underworld, we now think it's home and we've forgotten the return journey. So the wrestle that I'm in with those nine words is to do with the, the business of Eden the business of the, the faith of my childhood, uh, my life as a, you know, as an animist and a mythologist and a storyteller and all of that stuff. Um, and that's all I have to say about it for right now, but I'm, I'm really enjoying it. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a route never in a thousand years I would have predicted was going to talk to me, but that is so far what has come out of, uh, my rummage in the forest. Um, I think in terms of there are human beings who have certainly influenced me as storytellers. When I first saw storytelling, it was so overwhelming. I didn't know how anybody could remember the narratives. They seemed so long and it, it was very intimidating to me. So if anybody out there is interested in learning stories, just learn a small little Grimm's tale with a couple of pages, chew it in your mouth and tell it as if you're telling it to someone down in a cafe or a pub, a story you're excited by. Now, but who, who has influenced me? I've been very influenced by the work of the philosopher Gaston Bachelard and his book, The Poetics of Space. I've been very influenced by the German artist, Joseph Beuys, who was a Luftwaffe pilot shot down in the war and filled with shrapnel. And he became a kind of grief man for the unmetabolized sorrow of the Second World War from a German perspective. To give you an image of the way Boyce operates, when Boyce came to um, New York for the first time to do a show, he was wrapped in felt, taken by an ambulance to a local gallery where there was nothing in the gallery but but hay and a coyote. And he spent the whole week just communing back and forth with the coyote and some copies of the New York Times. And at a certain point when he was assured that energetic contact had been made with the coyote, he, uh, he turned and went back to Germany. And that was the show. And it was called I Like America and America likes me. That's the kind of thing that I'm very interested in. And, you know, as a young painter in my 20s, that was a kind of a window into what a really agile ritual sensibility could look like. I live, this might be interesting to people, if you could see the cottage I was in, if you go that direction for 20 miles, you come to North Torton, where Ted Hughes, who is a great lodestone for me and a great North Star, wrote Crow and, and Birthday Letters and, and all of that stuff, lived there with Sylvia Plath while she was living. And, and in the other direction, this is almost a bit like a ley line, in the village of Galpton, uh, just outside Brixham, is where Robert Graves wrote the first drafts of The White Goddess when it was called The Roebuck in the Thicket. So I feel energetically, vibrationally, between those two, two great counterweights. Gurus haven't been a big part of my life, but nature has been the big thing. Nature is too small a word for it, really. But there was a reason I was out in the bush for four years. There was a reason I trained as a wilderness 
rites of passage guide. And if you read my books carefully, line by line, you'll see the hints. Uh, but some things in this world are to be, to be talked about tacitly, not explicitly. Uh, and some areas of your spiritual life should remain tacit. And that's one of mine. So anyway, Pads, that's a few, uh, a few from me. Yeah, yes, uh, you can imagine I'm slightly exhausted by the question. Uh, I don't, please don't be take that person just because I've been doing that forever. But I'll talk about it a bit in the context of my own upcoming, uh, my own upcoming birthday. We tend to associate when we think of the word rites of passage, we tend to think of it as a an event that occurs at adolescence, you know, it's usually to commemorate a young girl becoming a woman or a man or a boy becoming a man or wherever you are on the, the spectrum of gender. But actually, of course, all the way through our lives, seasonally, we are designed to come to various crossroads. The old life no longer suits us. And at that point, we are you know, we, 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 there are some things that we have to put down and some things that we have to put, put up. Um, you look around the world, you have to remember, of course, that although to some people that will be watching this, 50 will seem awfully young to them, in terms of culture throughout history, you were lucky if you got to 50. So something I mentioned earlier on, the phrase bone memory, in the caribou dust of my bones, I think there's part of me that knows that hundreds of years before, I would have been at the end of my life around now. So a little glimpse, and I haven't talked about this to anybody, a little glimpse into my approach for turning 50s. I don't need to go out into the bush again. I've done so much of that. But I just, it's very interesting in life when you just ref you remove a few elements that you usually lean on. And so one of the things for me is that bar, I think possibly a, an occasional Guinness that might have slipped down my throat. There's been no alcohol for about five weeks. That's been good. That's been good to have a break from that. Um, I love the sweat lodge. I love the sauna, I love the heat. So every night I go into the dark and uh, it's a word people don't like very much these days, but it's a confessional. You know, I just sit in the dark in the heat and I, I talk and I listen uh, in the same way that I did in the forest. So in some way, what I've come out of lockdown with is a sense that I'm not interested remotely in just picking up where I left off. I'm grateful for everything that has got me to this point, but I'm very curious about what happens next. And there's nobody listening to this. It's true universally that, that there will be some narratives that we took in, some personal stories that we took into lockdown that we don't need to carry anymore. We can put them down. And so my quieter rite of passage that is beginning now is of a sense of profound gratitude that I've got to do what I've been able to do but also as I spoke to an actor, the actor Mark Rylance, and he talked about the danger in life of doing something well once and then you repeat it endlessly. Uh, and he called it reheating the meal. And so for me and for various other people I've told that to, reheating the meal is not good for you artistically. It's not healthy. So, this new decade that god willing i will get to the end of carl jung always said live as if you expect to live to 300 isn't that great so I keep <laughs> pushing that energy out into the world uh, i don't quite know what's going to happen next i'm grateful for everything up until this point um and so we shall we shall see the reason that i never leave rites of passage alone is because the wilderness vigil particularly is not an instruction from a human teacher. It's not like coming to the school of myth where you hear my own insights into the world of mythology. It's you and the tree 
and the crow and the wind and the rain and the dreams and the sun. Um, it is it is profound and in its way it's very pure. It's a very pure thing. So um, yeah, if anybody's interested in that or my my own publishing house is called Sister Mystica. You can find it online, Sister with C-I-S-T-A. And I have a lot of books on wilderness rites of passage and that kind of thing. And that's where they live. But yes, yes. And I mean, the, the mycelium network of, of gods and goddesses is a very interesting discussion. I'm very interested. I'm a long term, you know, uh, student of Dionysus. And there's that, you know, and you get this with Nietzsche and all of these sort of references to you know, the, inf in the inflammation of consciousness, I suppose. Um, I think it's a fascinating subject, but like everything in the West, it's all about context. It's a sort of, everyone, anyone I would speak to about, about that kind of visionary vine or visionary vegetable, it's a case by case basis. Who are you doing it with? Why are you doing it? And to be very careful with the environment around you. I watched, you know, 14 and 15 year old kids inhale salvia divinorum at house parties. Can you imagine the terror that descends on them at that moment? And of course the idea will be, well, it's okay because the experience is only six minutes long. It's only six minutes long in our version of time. But if you're into vegetative time, you could be down there for a generation. So I am not by any means sweeping it out the door because so many of the cultures uh, that I love and admire, it's been part of their religious life for centuries, but it's been well handled. I mean, what we come back to again and again is my old mentor, Robert Bly, wrote a very prophetic book, book that nobody bought about 25 years ago called The Sibling Society. He'd written Iron John that everybody loved. And then he, he went to a much more difficult subject and it, it, it bombed. But in it, the sibling society, he says, the trouble is we innately long for ritual and rites of passage, but we now attempt to either self-initiate or initiate within our own peer group. And that from an indigenous perspective is naive and dangerous. So it's not that the, the consciousnesses themselves are, are bad or wrong, but the context in which they're embarked on uh, can be simply not robust enough to handle it. You know, any, uh, you know, any magician will, will know that. Um, you, need, you really need to understand, you know, boundaries and your your tools, your, your spiritual and psychological toolkit. I, I, have, I have carried, I have carried a corpse. I've carried several, but the most prominent, the most prominent corpse I carried was of a, a woman, a beloved, a, beloved, a beloved young woman who died, most of us would regard as very early. Uh, and I carried her body with her husband and with her father and with her brother. And we took her from the bed that she had died in, rather than putting her in some sort of black bag, we took her down into a small room that we then filled with ice, huge blocks of ice, covered it in furs. And then she lay in a kind of Irish wake kind of manner for several days and people came from all over Europe, musicians and children and songs were sung to her and, you know, all good things happened and her children uh, got used to seeing her dead. They got used to seeing that something that it was essential in mum had moved out, had exfoliated in some way. So actually, yes, I have I have carried a dead body and I will never, ever forget it. Now, what's interesting about the bewitched princess is when does my question would be for all of us, when does a ghost become an ancestor? Uh, how 
how do you cultivate your relationship to the dead? And I am not talking about a Ouija board or a seance. I'm talking about your venerable dead, you know, your relationship to Goethe or Caravaggio, or your, your wild old aunt. How do you do it in such a way that you feel uh, sort of ancestrally instructed rather than haunted? Because I think that's probably from an indigenous eye on the West at the moment, they'd say, you've got everything, but the destruction you have gone through to get it means that you're a, you're a, you're a haunted culture uh, and that your world is actually a mock with ghosts. Um, that's too big for me to unpack here today, but uh, yeah, it's just a few thoughts about it. they can expect the first thing they'd have to do if they first of all you go to schoolofmyth.com and somewhere on that I don't look at websites really but you'd find you know you'd find some description it's probably called uh, I don't know the wilderness vigil or wolf milk or something like that and then you'd get a few pages of information but this is what you'd have to do we have to know that you're serious before you embark on this with us and the way you prove that is you write us a biography uh, probably 10,000 words, and you write about your life up until this point. Now, of course, you could probably write more than 10,000 words, but we wouldn't be able to read it. Um, we're looking to see that you have some kind of literacy about the life up until this point, the hard stuff, the good stuff, and primarily why you would be wanting to put yourself through something like this a four day and night fast out in the forest, just like the fairy tales. So imagine that we tick the box and say, great, okay, you're coming with us in six months, you're coming to do the vigil. The first thing you would do is wherever you lived, and that could be in Southeast London, or it could be in the Yorkshire Dales, you'd go for a day walk and you wouldn't eat anything, you take some water, and we'd ask you to just track what happens during that day, usually in a, a nature place, you know, a forest or a, or a hillside. And because of the kind of training that I've done, I can read a narrative in what to you will probably seem like a random set of events. Oh, and then I saw a fox and then there was a German with a with an ana a red anorak and, and then I fell asleep under a, in a hollow tree and then I went on and nothing is happening. Of course, everything is happening. And first thing about that is you find out how long a day is without regular meals or your phone or Facebook or, or anything like that or a book. It's just it's tough, actually. And the thought then that you may have to do that for four times that length puts a lot of people off. And that's good for us because we, you shouldn't, if you're not ready, you're not ready. But if you get through that as well, then you eventually, usually in a group of about six people, turn up at the forest where there is a team of about four to five of us, almost, um, you know, probably two, there's one person for every two of you. You have a couple of days to orientate. And what, what is really important about that period is we take you into the forest and at some point on a walk that takes about two hours, in a rather mysterious fashion, you suddenly go, oh, I need to be there. And you will wander in underneath a strange holly tree or next to a dry stone wall or up on a ridge looking out to the, uh, to the sea. One way or another, you find where it is you're meant to be. Or actually, again, more importantly, you get chosen. You get chosen by the place. During that period, I'm also, and the team, we're talking to you, finding out now you're here. What are you really feeling that you're here for? And that's when you see anxiety. And we, we need to see some anxiety from before you doing this. Otherwise, you are vacating the encounter because for most of us, you've never done anything like this before. Then after there, very early in the morning, after a couple of days, you were blessed out and we keep base camp going in the forest. We eat the food for you at base camp. So we have our little fire and we have our coffee and, and toast. 
and you go off into the gloom and the mystery and the mist and the wah, wah, wah of the woods. You sit under a tarp. So you don't have a tent. You can't make a fire, but you do have a tarp and you've got to stay dry. So you have a sleeping bag, you have pl plenty of water, you have a journal and you sit and you sit and you walk a little bit and you sit. The area that you can fast in is usually fairly large, but we don't want you wandering around the forest ad nauseum because you're going to start bumping into other vigilers. This goes on for four days. And basically, and now this, this, this brings us back to the question of, do you remember I told you about the teenager eating the salvia divinorum? Now, a wilderness rites of passage will profoundly change your consciousness, but it does it much, much, much slower. We call it bucket work. It's like going to the deep lake and just taking a bucket, slosh, there's a bit of water. In goes the bucket, slosh, bit of water. You're not inspecting the underside of the universe within five minutes. It happens slowly. And because it happens slowly, the memory of it will last longer for you. It'll go deeper. On the final night of the four days, and this is usually rather tough, you stay up all night. You basically sort of back up to a tree. And in the manner of vulnerable, beautiful human beings all over this planet, you cry for vision. You pray. You know, you really pray. Uh, you know, again, you don't cast spells. You're not looking for eternity. You're making prayers. You're making praise. You're blessing things. Again, that philosopher Gaston Bachelard says the world seeks to be admired by you. And it's, it's, a, it's a masterclass, the vigil, in learning how to admire things. Um, and when that has finished, and that is the longest night imaginable, it is the longest night, and it can be a very tough one, then and only then do you pick up your small bag, stagger back to the camp. You haven't seen a human face. You don't know what you look like. And this is the moment uh, that this is why all the wilderness guides keep doing it, because it's hard work. But when we see you come back into camp, it is, it is as near, it's that word. Here we are. It's Eden. It's Eden. Uh, the people that go out so jaded and mixed up and, and all of that, they come back and for a moment, do you remember that old song? You're probably too sophisticated to admit you like it, but I love it. Morning has broken. You know, it's an old hymn. It's like morning has broken. And you see, you see a look in people that they are, it's like those nine words, they are inhabiting the time and genesis of their original home. They have made, they have remade some kind of incredible covenant that's really hard to talk about. And they come back and do you know what they say? I don't think anything happened. It's always, they say nothing happened. And then you sit down by the fire and you start to talk and you start to listen and you start to tell the story back to them with no spin. You don't interpret it. You just mirror it. And then and only then does the enormity of the gift and the challenge they've been through reveal its hand. When I, a thousand years ago, if you'd done this, the moment of greatest peril would have been when you were out in the forest. The greatest peril now in 2021 is the return journey. It's actually going back to the society that you come from that may have real hostility or amnesia to the depth of that encounter. People's lives, I must hold my hand up, people's lives often change a bit after going through this. You can't, you can't unsee it. You can't unsee it. You can't unhave that encounter with the with the wilder earth. Um, and so for that reason, and this is the last thing I'll say, and it's a hard thing for people, when you come back, we do this. Don't talk about it for a year. Don't turn it into a podcast. Don't become, don't turn it into a blog. Don't turn it into a story. Sit as if you uh, have a seed of light in your womb or you have a seed that is growing, you know, in your, in your belly, you know, 
let it let it incubate this is profound information uh, and although you can talk to the other people that did it you have to you know let it be private let it be private for a period and then hopefully over time it becomes part of the great song of your own life and if anybody that is watching has enjoyed my books or has seen me teach you know i am the humble the humble recipient of the blessing that i'm describing the good the good that has come from me since then has just been me loyally following something that happened in the middle of the night on a welsh mountain a quarter of a century ago so come do a vigil yeah i'm so pleased so that is a uh, Myths from around the world. It's with, you know, the team here, Watkins Books. It's a beautiful little, do you know Spanish food? It's like tapas. They're glimpses into these wonderful worlds like Beowulf and Gilgamesh and uh, Inanna and all of these wonderful stories. Very, very good for younger people, I think, or any but visually sumptuous. But I was really pleased to write the foreword for it. I said to somebody, writing the foreword was like writing a little love letter back to my very young self that felt strange and insecure and didn't know how to deal with people, but loved adventure, loved story, loved mystery, loved gallantry. And this is all in it. So so jump in. And if you've if you've got, especially if you know, if you've got kids that or uncle friends, you know, it'll be Christmas soon enough. Thank you. <laughs> Good to all. Courage to everybody. Keep going.